good morning and welcome to this education mutual webinar for teaching staff. My name is Sandy Mann. Um, I'm a psychologist and I'm a lecturer in applied clinical psychology at university. In Man uh, I've also got a clinic in Manchester, so I'm also a clinician. And I'm clinical psychology lead for Sparta Health, um, who provide mental health support and counselling services to education mutual members across the UK. I'm also author of uh, a number of books. I've written about 20 psychology books, all available from uh, Amazon, if you want to have a look. Uh, some of them are self-help books. Some of them um, are just general psychology books. Um, I do have some experience in schools as well. I uh, don't know if you, some of you may remember, about 10 years ago, there was a programme, an initiative called the Aim Higher Initiative, uh, where we got, we got people going into schools from universities to try and encourage uh, it's pupils who may not have thought of going to university to aim higher and consider university. So I did a lot of training in schools on behalf of my university then. Uh, I also am project lead on a truancy project or an anti-truancy project aimed at uh, a more holistic approach to getting those pupils and students who uh, perhaps are not engaging with school to engage with school. So I do have some experience in schools. Obviously, I'm a, a university lecturer as well. So uh, I've had some experience that you lot are going through which is having to switch to online provision very very quickly um, and yes it has not been easy there have been a lot of challenges with that uh, we've had to probably switch to a whole new way of teaching as you have in uh, a week maybe something that I think previously had we considered this would probably taken a year or so to transition so I do understand a lot of the strains and stresses that you're going through so how this webinar is going to work today, I've got uh, 30 minutes and um, obviously a lot of you have submitted questions, which is really good. I'm going to try and get through as many of those questions as I possibly can. Uh, I've clumped a lot of them together because a lot of themes, so we'll address some of those. Um, feel free to comment in the chat box or chat pod, as I think it's called. Uh, comment, uh, send more questions. Uh, we do have a webinar moderator team who will uh, take your questions and pass any that uh, they hope that I can answer on to me. Um, so I'll be looking at various different devices as we um, talk or as I talk, trying to make sure that uh, I can react to anything that you say or any of your comments as well. Uh, if I don't get through all your questions, feel free to submit them anyway and we'll try and do a blog or we'll answer them later on um, outside of this session because obviously we've got uh, quite a short time and quite a lot to get through. So I'm going to start really with looking at um, some of the, the, the general ideas of how to stay positive, because this is obviously very uncertain times and um, we all are looking to stay positive. And actually, there are quite a few questions that have come in about positivity. I'm going to uh, read this one to you and I'll try and address this. Um, Dr. Mann, do you have any advice or suggestions on how we can encourage and maintain uh, ongoing positivity for staff members and pupils during the current lockdown situation. So I've had quite a lot of questions along those lines. So that's what I'm going to start off. How do we maintain positivity? Um, it is difficult. We're in very difficult, uncertain times. I'm going to talk about uncertainty a bit later on as a whole separate concept. But um, it, there's a lot of anxiety, obviously, and um, uncertainty and distress. So you'd think that it's difficult to pull anything positive from this. But there is a lot of good stuff out there as well. And I think the way to stay positive is very simple. It's really collecting and noticing and noting any of those positive, good things that are out there. There. When this all started um, in the first few days, I think a lot of us were in shock and we'd lost so much. We were, it was like a state of grief. We'd lost a lot. We saw only the negatives. We can't do this. We can't do that. We, we're not going to be able to do that. We, we've got death and misery all around us. It was all negative. Um, and I remember right at the start trying myself to say, well, what's good about this? What's positive about this? And uh, noting the things that I enjoy, the things that are good in the, in the world. And I'll be honest with you, there wasn't a lot. I was noting things like, well, I can still have a hot bath and enjoy that. I can still have a nice cup of coffee. But there wasn't much beyond that. But as we've gone through and we've gone through these stages of acceptance, almost like a grief procedure, really. Um, and we're now in more sort of hopefully more um, moving forward sort of stages. I think there's a lot of um, positive stuff out there, more than we perhaps realised at the start. Uh, I only have to look around on the in social media, in my street, in my community. 
to see the immense positivity there, the communities coming together, people helping each other, um, the creative ideas that parents, teachers, uh, the community are coming up with to look after kids, to teach kids, to entertain pupils and students. There's so much positivity out there. So what I think is a really good exercise for, for us all to do after this webinar, take 10 minutes at the end of this webinar uh, and just write down all that's good in your life. I know there's bad stuff. Write down the good stuff. Things that you're grateful for, number one, and things that you can enjoy and are enjoying, number two. OK, so it's very much about noticing um, all the good stuff that you can be grateful for. So um, I'm grateful that I can still go for a walk if the weather's OK. We've had really nice weather, which I've been really grateful for. Uh, I'm grateful that I can watch sunsets. I've got this real thing now about watching sunsets. It's something I never really noticed before. Sunsets were those things that you had to go to exotic locations to enjoy. Uh, but now you can look out your window, you go down the street. Every sunset is different. You know, it's a simple stuff in life. Um, there's a lot of good stuff that we can enjoy. We don't have to go on commutes anymore. We don't have to travel. We can get up later. We don't have to dress as smartly. We don't have to be as formal. Uh, what's really exciting, I think, and perhaps the, the most positive thing about lockdown is how to do things differently. And the fact that we are doing things differently and different can be good. Change can be good. There's a lot of change at the moment. And that can be really scary, especially for people who uh, like things to be uh, planned and certain. But change can be good as well. And sometimes we have to be forced into it. But the, even the fact that we're doing this webinar now is something we wouldn't have been able to do before. Uh, all the training that we're doing now, the things that we're doing, things that, that they said couldn't be done. Uh, I'm a therapist as well and I'm doing therapy online. We couldn't, we, we couldn't do it two months, two months ago. We couldn't do it, it wasn't possible. I'm attending training, uh, therapy training, two months ago, oh no, you've got to do that live. And we're doing it now. And not only is it working, it's working really well. And in some cases, it's better than it used to be. In some cases, things are better than they used to be. Just think about that. I'm doing therapy that is better than it used to be had we not been forced into this situation. And I think we can deliver education in schools in a way that is some, maybe better. The future going forward may be better than it has been. So lots of things to look forward to. Lots of positivity there to be gleaned um, if we can just stop and notice it. Um, so I'm going to move on to the second lot of questions. I know there are some questions coming in and I am noting them um, and I'll fit those in as and when is relevant. But I'm gonna look at the flip side and now of that positivity because I really want to start on a positive note and if possible, end on a positive note. But I am aware obviously of the anxiety and there's a lot of questions that have been coming in about how to manage anxiety um, in these very difficult, uncertain times. So let me uh, read out uh, this question, I think, which encapsulates a lot of the questions that have come in. How can I help manage my anxiety during these tough times? Um, when all this is over, how am I going to find the strength to go back out into the world? Without worrying, it will all go wrong and the virus begin to spread again. So as I say, a lot of questions with those sorts of themes. So yeah, these are again about managing anxiety and managing uncertainty. I'm gonna focus on the anxiety as aspect now and, and hope to come on to managing uncertainty a little bit later on. Um, anxiety is all about worrying about things in general that might happen or that are going to happen in the future. We invest a lot of time worrying about things in the future, things that may happen or may not happen. There are a lot of benefits to worry. You know, anxiety is um, an emotion that has evolutionary benefits. Every emotion has a purpose. And like all emotions, um, anxiety is there for a reason. And anxiety and worry helps us prepare. And that is really important. You know, it's, that's the point of it. If we worry about something, we can prepare for something better. So if we're worried about the virus, we can take precautions. We want to be worried about the virus because that gives us the anxiety, enough anxiety to take the necessary precautions, to wash our hands, to uh, take all the government advice and things like that. Um, obviously, too much anxiety becomes counterproductive. Um, and that's one of the problems. Sometimes people have very 
uh, very strong beliefs about worry. And they think it, if you actually stop and think about it, some people think it protects them more than it actually does. Well, if I worry about this and it's less likely to happen uh, and there's almost a superstitious element to that, that I've got to worry, otherwise uh, it might happen. And my worrying actually prevents something happening. Uh, if, if that's you, stop and think about that for a moment. You know, is it really possible that the process of rumination going over something around and around in your head can actually stop it happening? Probably not. Yes, there's some elements where of protectiveness and taking measures to protect yourself. But once you've done those beyond that, there's not a lot of benefit to worry, but there's a lot of negatives to worry. You get into a whole worry cycle. So how do we deal with that? What we need to do with worry really is to divide our worry up into those things that we can do something about and those things that we can't. And those things that we can't are probably hypothetical what if type situations. So those things that we can do something about are the easiest worries to, to deal with. We can plot them, we can write them down, we can take action. So we can follow government advice. We can make sure we're strict about following government advice. Uh, we can help our neighbours, we can help people. We can, we can do stuff that can make things better. But then there are things that we can't do much about. Um, we can't do, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We don't know what's going to happen with schools. We don't know what's going to happen with the virus. Um, there's probably two things that we do know. Um, one is that the virus probably isn't going to go away very quickly. Um, and two, that uh, we're going to be living in uncertain times. Those are probably two certainties at the moment. So then we have to look at um, our thought processes. And with worry, a lot of our worry is connected with having uh, unhelpful thinking styles. We all have unhelpful, unhelpful thinking styles at times. And part of tackling our worry is identifying and noticing when we engage in unhelpful thinking styles. So here's some examples of unhelpful thinking patterns that you might engage in. Some of you will, some of you more than others. Certainly all of us will engage in some of these at some point. So one is overestimation of threat whilst underestimating our own coping strategies. So I've had people contact me saying, you know, I'm going to get sick. I'm going to get really sick. I won't be able to cope. I won't be able to feed my family. And actually, that's an overestimation of the risk and the threat. And it's also an underestimation of your own coping abilities or your abilities to be helped by other people. There is a lot of support and a lot of help out there, even for very vulnerable people. Uh, we also do a lot of threat scanning. So we're constantly looking for uh, threats. We're searching to um, to reinforce our beliefs that this is going to be a catastrophe. So we catastrophize as well. So we're checking ourselves for symptoms of coronavirus constantly. Uh, we're checking the news reports constantly. This is all threat scanning that leads and feeds into our worry or worries. Um, we do a lot of hypothetical worrying. What if? What if this happens? What if that happens? These are often things we can't control. So worrying isn't helpful. We can o worrying is only helpful for those things we can do something about. There's another unhelpful thinking pattern, which is the use of emotional reasoning. This is where we feel something, so we think it must be true. So I feel scared, therefore the threat must be real. And that's actually not logical. Our, our emotions are not always connected with our with the reality. So a good example of this uh, is to think of somebody who's scared of flying. So I work a lot with people with phobias and anxiety conditions in my clinic. And a lot of people who are afraid of flying will say things to me like, um, well, I get this feeling if I'm going to board a plane, I get this feeling. That's the feeling part that the plane's going to crash. And therefore, I'm really scared. And obviously, we, what they've got to learn is that feeling is not connected to the reality. So just because they feel something doesn't mean that that plane's going to crash. The feeling does not cause the reality. We don't have second sight. We don't have that ability to uh, feel something and make that come true. So just because we feel scared doesn't mean the risk is any bigger. It's because we feel it. We also engage in another un unhelpful thinking pattern, which is fortune telling. We know what's going to happen. We think we know what's going to happen. We don't. That's the one thing that is certain about these uncertain times. We don't know what's going to happen. And that can be good as well. You know, there's a lot of positives to not knowing what's going to be happening. I'll come back to that a little bit later when we talk about managing uncertainty. So dealing with these unhelpful thinking patterns, the first thing is recognising them, 
noticing when you do this, when you engage in this, um, try and redirect your attention to facts, focus on the facts, get your information from reliable sources like uh, gov.uk, perhaps BBC News, um, try and ignore other sources of information like social media, which is not always that reliable. Um, and try and look at those hypothetical worries where you don't have control and focus instead your attention on those worries where you do have control. So those things that you can control, you can control a lot in your life. It might seem that like there's a lot out of control, but actually there's also a lot we can control. We can control what we eat, what we feed our families. We can control the content of our, the learning provision that we're providing. We can build our own resilience. Um, we can follow advice and control that. Um, we can um, seek connections with people. We can get close to people. There's a lot of things we can control in our lives. So it's about focusing on those aspects, really. Um, OK, so I'm going to move on to uh, another question. And again, we'll come back to some of this anxiety stuff a little bit later. But I want to just change direction a little bit because a uh, very interesting question. I'm going to read this one out. Um, sometimes I have one of those days where I feel purposeless and may do very little or I'm demotivated or I start lots of different jobs but complete none of them so I'm unfocused both of which leave me feeling dissatisfied what would your advice be for making the most of one of those days either from a practical or psychological perspective so a little bit of a change of direction here um, which I thought would be nice because this is practical advice this is um, very relevant. How do we stay focused? I think this is something that was really difficult at the beginning and it still is for some people because there's so much distraction, there's so much worry, there's so much anxiety. We might be caring for people, we might be looking after uh, vulnerable loved ones who are shielding or neighbours. Uh, going to the shops is a, is a major operation now if you're able to get to the shops, ordering online. You know, these are all things that used to be fitted into our lives and now are becoming our lives really. So how do we stay focused? So some tips really on staying focused. Um, it's really important to plan your day, to schedule your day. I plan the night before what I'm going to be, what I'm hoping to do the next day. I try and prioritise, I try and have lists, I try and keep it sensible and practical and not too much overloading. And by that I mean you've got to build in time for all these other things that have now taken over our lives. Um, if you need supplies, you've got to realise that's going to take time. So we've got to build that time in and probably double it because it's probably going to take longer than we ever imagine. Weekly goals, daily goals, um, try and uh, have lots of checklists, lots of to-do lists. They feel good when you can tick things off your lists. Review the day at the end of the day, at the beginning of the day. Um, it's OK to lose focus sometimes. We have to give ourselves a break, you know, cut ourselves some slack. Life is difficult. Things are tougher than they have been. So it's OK. It's not losing focus so much as um, redirecting our attention. So look at it differently. Um, so be kind to yourself if that happens. I think um, a tidy workspace is really important. Uh, for a lot of people so try and tidy up at the end of the day make your day uh, make start your workspace um, in a tidy way at the beginning sometimes people find that um, it's difficult to have a tidy workspace because we're in a time where we might be working in a, 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 a very small space a space we're not used to working with but even if it's a little corner of the room that's yours make it yours make it your tidy space Sleeping, eating, exercise, these are all really important things. Um, Somebody has sent a, a question about keeping teenagers um, active and positive during lockdown as well. And it's really important to um, try and encourage yourself, your, uh, any, any of your, the people that you're with, to find some exercise that they enjoy. I love going for walks. Um, the younger people in my house hate doing that, but they're happy to watch a Joe Wicks video. So it's whatever suits, whatever works for them. Incidentally, in terms of keeping teenagers positive, all the things that I said before can be applied to young people as well, children as well. They're all perfectly relevant um, to everybody. Children and teenagers can um, look for the positives and the things they're grateful for just as much. Um, 
So uh, the only other thing I would say about staying focused is to try and have a kind of end of day ritual. Um, one of the problems that we have at the moment is that we don't have that transition between work and home. Everything is the same now. We're doing everything through a screen. Um, we can be looking, we can be Zooming or click meeting and we're doing the same function with friends and social as we are with um, work. So having an end of day ritual where we if you like do that commute virtually is really important just taking a few minutes at the end of the day to transition in your head from one zone to another can be really important um okay i'm going to move on because um keeping an eye on time as well um i want to talk about so i've mentioned talking to teenagers and working with teenagers there um i'm going to look at uh, how we talk to children there have been a few questions about talking to uh, children, young people. Uh, one question, is it important to talk to children of different ages about corona differently? And uh, when is it too young to talk to a child about coronavirus? Uh, if they have a question, should you answer their question? I'm getting a lot of comments on the chat as well about um, um, working with young people. So obviously a lot, you're all going to be working with young people. Um, there's a lot of resources that uh, give further advice than I can give in just a few minutes, like Young Minds, um, mentalhealth.org.uk, British Psychological Society, um, ICANN, the website ICANN. I think the most important thing is to be truthful and answer the questions when they come up. Um, the questions will come up. That, that Children will see what's going on. Obviously, they're not at school. They know something big is happening. They're going to start seeing masks in the street. They know they can't do their usual activities. They know that they can't visit their grandparents and stuff like that. Allow questions. Give people space for those questions. Um, answer what's asked. Don't necessarily volunteer extra information. That's a way to tailor your advice to the right age group. Ask the question, answer the questions that they ask. Don't answer questions that they don't ask. Um, that way you can keep it tailored. Um, Emphasise the um, positivity. We are coping with difficult times, but there's a lot of positives. We can care for each other. We can look after each other. We can make ourselves as safe as we can be and we can be kind. And I think that kindness and caring is um, really, really important which kind of leads me on to the area of managing uncertainty for, for children, for teenagers and for ourselves. Um, I know I'm skipping quite quickly through, but I am aware of time. Um, and managing uncertainty, and I know there's a lot of questions coming in about, um, about this, is, is really key. Um, and I think in the few minutes I've got left, I really want to focus on the positives of, of uncertainty. Uh, because as humans, we crave certainty, some of us more than others. Um, and there was one question that somebody sent about how uh, are some people um, more vulnerable to uh, mental distress at this time than others. And I think a lot of it is about how we cope with uncertainty. And one thing that is certain is that we're going to have to learn to cope with uncertainty as best as we can now. And one way to do that is to look at the positives. Um, we, we do like certainty, it's a human need, but we actually generally only live in an illusion of, a, of certainty. So even before lockdown, before Corona, we thought we knew what we were doing. We thought we, we had a routine and we knew that every day, get up, go to school, we do this, we do that. And we thought we had certainty. But, you know, the world is very fickle and certainty is an illusion, really. Uh, we never know what's going to happen. We never knew what was going to happen before. We just thought we did. And that's the key. We, we didn't we never used to focus our attention so much on that uncertainty, even though it was still there. We never knew what was going to happen tomorrow. Um, there's that saying, isn't there, about uh, man makes plans and God laughs, that kind of thing. You know, we never knew we were never certain, but we thought we are. Now that illusion has been shattered. So we feel that we're more uncertain than before. Um, and in some ways we, 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 we are. But there's a lot of benefits to that as well. It's potentially exciting times. We don't know what's going to happen. We're going to have to adapt and change. We're going to have to become more resilient. Resilience is the key to surviving mentally and being mentally healthy in these uncertain times. And so it's reframing that uncertainty. Instead of seeing it as something really negative, I don't know what's going to happen. It's really scary. Just something positive. I don't know what's going to happen. It's really exciting. And it is exciting. There's a lot of exciting stuff out there. The way we're doing things differently, and I started off with this and I want to go back to this. The, we're doing 
things now that they said couldn't be done. And I think in education, the potential for mass change in education is, is enormous. This could be, this period could be the time of greatest change, greatest creativity, greatest innovation in the whole history of humankind. We might change the way, we are changing the way we teach. Um, I've got a school aged child and um, he's getting more differentiated learning. Um, he's getting more responsive learning. Um, there's much, there can be much closer interaction with the parents, which may or may not be a good thing, but it could be harnessed to be a good thing. Um, when eventually schools go back, there might be smaller classes with um, pupils coming in for um, shifts and you know less time in the classroom, um, but more quality time. So we have a great opportunity here to do things differently. And yes, things are going to change. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. But with that comes a lot of opportunity as well, a lot of excitement. Lots of um, comments coming in um, about strategies for coping with these uncertain times. People asking about mindfulness apps. Um, and that's actually a really good point that somebody's raised. Um, I'm also aware we've only got four minutes left, but um, being mindful uh, is really important. With uncertainty, it's always about the future. We are certain about some things. We are certain about what's happening now. Right now, you're watching this. You know, we're certain about that. You can go for a walk and you can be fairly certain, fairly certain that you know what you're going to be doing in those next 10 minutes. So being mindful is always is all about focusing on the here and now, focusing on the moment, the things that we are certain about. Enjoy. So I'm going back to where I was at the start, which is enjoy where you are now. If you're enjoying a nice cup of co coffee, a hot chocolate, whatever, enjoy it. A hot bath, whatever it is, a walk in the, uh, I was going to say sunshine, but um, we may not always have the sunshine, but watching the seasons change, watching the rainfall, enjoy the moment. There's plenty of time to worry about the future and all that uncertainty, but focus on the moment. Uh, and that's a really positive way to just put that worry to one side perhaps give yourself worry time. Well, I'll, I'll worry about the uncertain future later at this time. Set yourself a time. But for now, I'm going to focus on what's going well now, what's happening now, what's enjoying, sorry, just turning my phone back on, what's going, what's really good about what's happening now. Um, so somebody else is asking about uh, the value of going outdoors and outdoor learning. I think it's really positive to get outdoors and get into nature. Um, and again, that's about being mindful and being positive about what we can do, focusing on what we can do and not what we can't do. So it is about focusing on the present. It's about rejigging our whole mindset from uh, these anxious and certain times to being these exciting times when we can do things differently. Uh, there's been a question about outdoor learning, for example. We can look at that now. Uh, harder in this country, perhaps, because um, obviously we don't always have the weather for it. I know other countries are looking at uh, outdoor spaces more, um, but we can adapt. Um, perhaps we need to look at uh, creative ways to do that. And somebody else has asked about putting um, learning into practice. Again, this is all about using your creativity. You have it within us. We all have that creative potential in a in it within us and this is a time when we have the best opportunity for um allowing that creativity to burst out um and we've got that opportunity to sit back we've stopped the world we've stopped the roller coaster of the world spinning round uh, the, the the roller the roundabouts going round around the carousel we've stopped it we're off the roller coaster now we can stop and think and allow our creativity to flourish this could be a great opportunity. So it's all about refocusing and re in re seeing. We call this cognitive reframing that the uh, distress of the uncertainty and the distress of the anxiety can turn into something positive. Not all the time. It won't work all the time. Um, there's going to be many times when we just feel overwhelmed. And I think that. Um, one of the things that we're often overwhelmed about is information as well and advice. And uh, there's a lot of information out there. So cut yourself some slack. Be kind, to, be kind to yourselves. We have to accept that these are challenging times, but we've got the resources. We're stronger than we think. We can rise to the challenge. We can use this uh, period of uncertainty, this period of lockdown, this whole virus environment that we're in and that we'll continue to be in to greater good. We can see our society change for the better. We can see a kinder society where we're helping people more. 
and we can see education changing. We're seeing it changing right now. And so we can harness those benefits and um, take them forward and see something really, really good and positive come out of what is a very challenging time. So I'd like to thank you all for listening and watching. Obviously, there's a limit to what advice I can give in 30 minutes, but I hope that you've got at least one take home message from that. So many thanks again and uh, everybody um, keep up the good work uh, with school and stay safe.